I'm honored to be here, and I want to thank each of you first to start with gratitude for the ability to be on this particular panel, kind of coming out of the closet, if you will, in terms of mindfulness, spirituality, consciousness, and the conversation that I see shifting. And what I want to start with is that we are on the precipice of a profound shift in the way we view addiction and the way we I'm going to use air quotes, treat addiction. And I hope to be controversial right out of the gate. We work in an industry where we have collectively accepted that 10 to 15% success rate is acceptable. We also work in an industry where we have, looking back, kind of used one model and then reframed it over and over and over again or reinterpreted it. And what I want to say is I think it's time for us to shift the conversation from addiction treatment to addiction healing. And I actually know that we have the ability as clinicians, as counselors, as therapists to be on a new journey toward a profound shift. And I really love, Renee, that you talked about horses and the power of the energy exchange. So I'm gonna talk about frequency, I'm gonna talk about consciousness, and I'm gonna talk about how such a small amount of what we really do has anything to do with thought or the words we use. You know, we, have, we now know that only 10% roughly, 10% of, of communication is verbal, so many of us have accepted that the other 90% is body language. That's what I hear over and over and over again. And I actually think that's another 10%. The rest is energy or frequency. And I'm grateful that I can sit up here and talk about this now because 10 years ago, well, Saul and I worked together 12 years ago, and I had to keep that kind of a secret because that's what I was doing then because I wanna share with you a little bit of my own journey uh, I've been sober for 33 years. I've been working in the field for 12 years, back in 2008 in Altamira in Sausalito. And I quickly realized that most of the modalities were focused on symptoms and behaviors, rather than getting down to the deeper root causes that actually drive addiction. And we collectively have decided a few things, and one of those is that we don't treat trauma, we don't really address the underlying root issues. We're here to stabilize them. After all, we only have them for 28 days, or in current times, 12 days sometimes. What I want to offer is that that's a fine approach for many clients. It might even be a fine approach for the majority of clients. But I want to speak to the shift that's happening where we're now recognizing that there is not a one-size-fits-all and that we have clients that are coming back to our treatment programs three, four, and five times, and then we're asking them the question, what are you gonna do differently this time? Yes. And how many people in this room work directly with clients? So I have an invitation for you. Rather than asking your client what they're gonna do differently, I invite you to take a look in the mirror and ask, yourself what you can do differently to work with the client that is at our program for three, four, and five times. And I can tell you that those clients that have that degree of relapse, I can say with pretty much confidence that it's about 100% of the time it's unresolved trauma. And trauma in our field has had a particular, we've had a particular perspective about that and that it's, it's so ironic to me that our perspective has been, let's not address this trauma, let's not go there. They might deregulate, they might have this intense emotional experience and then relapse. But in my experience, the opposite is what's true. If I don't create a space, which is what I really want to focus on today, if I do not create a space for my client to actually go into that emotional experience, that's what's creating the relapse. So many of us are putting a band-aid on a very deep core issue that is unresolved trauma, spiritual disconnection, and toxic shame. And in my experience, those are the three root causes of addiction 
through this spiritual lens. And I like to call it pies. A client taught me that. Physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual. Recognizing that there are physical aspects to addiction and recovery. Recognizing that it's important, as you said so eloquently, to look at the cognitive piece of it. But many of us stop there. And I'm not, again, I want to be really clear, that's important and. It's not this or that. It's this and that. And so what I want to uh, say about that is that conscious recovery began with a very, very simple question 12 years ago. And that question is or was for myself. And that question is very simple. What if underneath all addictive behavior is a whole and perfect spiritual being? I came into this world very happy, very connected with myself, in awe of the world, and feeling like the luckiest person alive. Mesmerized by a butterfly. Mesmerized by a blade of grass. And I came into a family system where dad was very busy with women, and maybe sometimes men. This is <laughs> finding freedom, so I'll add that. That were not my mother. My mother, had she been born 20 years later, would not have chosen to be a mother. How do I know this? She told us, repeatedly. I don't know why I chose to be a mother. So by the time I was seven, I built a wall around my heart. And I have come to identify that not as a defense mechanism or a coping strategy, but as a brilliant strategy for my own survival. And I walked around that way from 7 until 13, where I discovered a different blade of grass to be mesmerized by, and I found relief. So I also have come to recognize, and obviously many of us say this, addiction or substance is not the problem, it's the solution. And so my invitation for each of us is to recognize the profound impact that we have on our clients simply by the energy or the frequency that we're holding. Because if I'm looking for what's broken, it's now being measured by the quant by quantum mechanics. That there are endless possibilities in every situation, but as soon as I call it something, it comes into manifestation. So how does that apply to my work? How does that apply to our work? If I'm walking into a session looking for what's broken, we're gonna find that more, we're, we're likely to find that. And as a matter of fact, we might even be creating more of that in our clients. They already feel broken. Shame is such a root cause of addiction. And then many of us unconsciously co-sign on that. Let me help you identify what's broken and let me help you fix it. Let me provide you tools to fix yourself. What if they're not broken? What if within each person is the innate ability, ability to heal? What if I was to recognize that underneath all addictive behavior was this whole and perfect person? What does that create? What are the infinite possibilities in how I work with someone based on my perspective of that person? That was a long answer. With this. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. Well, it's it's the concept of creating that space for people to come back home to that part of you, you know, before all the messages were coming in about, you know, your mother not wanting to be a mother. Um, why do you think it's so hard for us as practitioners to, to deal with shame and trauma with our clients? Where did, why are we so afraid of going there? I have a very simple answer. I haven't worked through my own. I cannot possibly hold a space for a client to move toward and work with their trauma if I haven't worked with my own. And that's the issue I see in our field, and I'll just be, to be more transparent, that was the issue for me. Because I didn't yet understand how to work with my own trauma and my own shame. And therefore, if I'm in a session with someone and facilitating a group, and someone starts going into their trauma or their shame or their disconnection, if I'm not doing my own inner work, my own healing, I will unconsciously or consciously stop the client from moving deeper into that. 
Now, we have also conveniently created a shared agreement around that by saying, oh, that's not what we do here. Mm. And yet, and I, and, and I want to be clear about something, I'm not suggesting that we dig down and try to get our clients to move into their trauma, that that's our job to move them there. But what happens is they're showing up with it. It's in the room, and if I haven't worked through or with my own, I'm gonna unconsciously stop it. That's the power of working with a team. You know, I, I, our, our next presenter, Dr. Krista Gilbert, was my first uh, clinical supervisor in this field 12 years ago, and I'm immensely grateful for her dedication to trusting her own inner voice, her own inner compass, her own knowingness that, that sources who she is. Another way to say that is intuition. Don Miguel Ruiz in his book, The Four Agreements, and I'm, I'm saying this, I say it a lot, but I'm saying it specifically because you're here, Renee. He uses the term the domestication of the human. And when we break a horse, when we domesticate a horse, we call it breaking them or breaking their spirit. And so we come into this world, if it's true that we come into this world as whole and perfect beings, and we get programmed by the messages from our family systems, from our school systems, trauma then becomes much more normalized. I'm not a huge fan of big T, little t trauma because we're automatically comparing our trauma. And it's easy for a client to sit in a circle in a group and hear a person talking about being raped or being beaten every day, and then to say, who am I to say, and this is mine, that I couldn't tie my shoes in kindergarten, so I decided I was stupid. How could I possibly bring that up when I'm sitting next to this person who had what seems like real trauma? So the domestication of the human is something that I can get my, my mind around to recognize that if we're seen as anything other than whole and perfect, that is a traumatic experience through the spiritual lens. That there is physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual trauma, and of course, vicarious trauma. I've worked with clients that say, I don't have trauma. And I understand that because we're in the, 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 the realm of comparing. No one beat me. I remember working with a client that said, I don't have trauma, and in our third session, he was able to access a memory of being under the table in his kitchen and watching his father pull a knife on his mother. So what I want to say, because I think we're moving toward closing of my time, I want to, what I want to talk about for a moment is the power of holding space. I have the honor of, uh, I've had the honor of creating spiritual care programs at some, uh, at a few different treatment programs, and I was often the person that was called in when someone was emotionally dysregulating, and you know what that really means, is either losing their shit or melting down. That's you know, what, the, what we really might call that. And I recognized that most of the time we were focusing on the symptoms of that. I remember a client was moved from a top floor at Altamira with the sunken tub and the beautiful view of downtown San Francisco. She was being moved unexpectedly to the basement. And they came to me and said, this client is being really entitled because she doesn't want to give up the bathtub and the view. The moment I hold the BS belief system that this client is entitled, I lose the opportunity to find out what's really happening. And the reason they called me in was really simple. I could sit and be present and be curious about this client's wholeness. And what happened is she remembered during our time together that she was molested in the basement. Her bags were packed and she was ready to leave before that. If I would have just said, yes, she's entitled, make her go down to the room, or even, well, let's just let her have her nice room. The reason I'm saying that is that each of us has the ability through our own consciousness and our own frequency to hold a space of openness, compassion, and love for our clients and to recognize through that holding of that space, something profound can happen within that client I don't need to know what that is. But as soon as I decide what it is, we might miss the opportunity. Mm. So, um, I think sort of to start wrapping us up, 
the concept that I was thinking of, and a lot of you have been in motivational training with me and motivational interviewing, and show the video of Monty Roberts with the horse and how we've started calling it starting the horse instead of breaking the horse. And, and what he's doing in, in that video and why we show it is that um, the horse is, is frightened and is looking for a way out and it's in a round pen, so there's, there's no way to go but left or right. And what he's doing is he is asking something of that horse. He's giving direction and, you know, we have to do that in our programs and, and to some degree in our, in our practices. But what he's doing is watching the response and then he starts being in relationship with the horse and allowing the horse to kind of calm down and communicate back with him with no words. And then he's changing what he does in response and relaxes, takes the pressure off at one point and kind of drops his shoulders so the horse can come over and create that partnership. And at some point he says, you know, what I don't want to do is, is create pain or harm, right? I just want to keep this space till the horse feels in their own time to come over. And then he starts kind of rubbing the back and underneath he said, I don't want to go into the vulnerable areas until this happened first, right? So, and, and in the end, it's about the connection and the partnership of each of them being who they are. Yeah, especially, you know, I, um, I got in some trouble on social media because I did a talk once and I said, one thing I know about our clients is they're highly attuned. And someone who's worked in the field for 30 years kind of went after that, honestly, and said, how, be, how dare you? They're checked out, they're addicted, they're not attuned. And that's not my experience because especially our clients that have trauma, which again is 100% of them in my experience, uh, on some degree, because they were born on planet Earth, right? Uh, they were programmed to believe they're not who they are. They were programmed to believe that the illusion is reality and the reality is the illusion. Uh, they're highly attuned to safety. And how do I create a safe container? They are judging themselves. So much shame. Uh, many of them come from a family system, especially our young adults, or if you work with adolescents, where they're constantly being labeled and told what to do. We have youth being diagnosed with what we call personality disorders, which that is another talk that I'm gonna just save for another time. <laughs> and then they're labeled as that, and they're being told constantly what they need to do and what they're not doing. And as a clinician, we have the opportunity to simply be a field of presence. And when I'm a field of presence for someone, they automatically drop into safety. Now that's not 100% of the time, but there's a higher, a higher probability or a highly likelihood that the client is gonna feel safe when I hold that space. And again, holding space is about me clearing and doing my own work of healing. And then we can be a conduit, as you've said, or a frequency of healing. 